There's been some good news recently for Australian producers, with prices up across the board. While the medium to broad range of wools are doing particularly well, growers are no longer getting a premium for superfine wool, which is why dual purpose merinos grown for both wool and meat are becoming more popular, as Fiona Breen reports. There's a buzz in the shearing shed at Tipperary Park in northeast Victoria. And it's not just the electric shears. Property owners Andrew and Penny Wall are running on adrenaline. Good wool prices and the drought have forced their hand and they're shearing early. We've already fed enough grain and, and hay out, and even though the prices, the prices are good, even if they're not in great nick, and you might as well offload them because, yeah, it's, it's tough season. Although they're spending $4,000 a week on grain and hay, Andrew Wall is still expecting to turn a profit. He says a decision to stock a bigger type of merino for wool and meat is paying off in hard times. I'm very happy with these sheep because they cut your 50 volt per the wall and you've got twins in them, it's fantastic. So, as, as a merino, yeah, you can't get much better than that. Not all of these merinos will be kept for wool growing. The weathers or castrated males will be sent to the meat market after shearing. The recent surge in the wool and meat price has made it viable. We're still going to make a profit, quite a good profit out of these sheep this year, even though I'm feeding a lot more than I ever have before. One of the reasons why merinos are being used increasingly as dual purpose meat and wool animals is because of recent improvements in genetics. That's a lovely crimp there, that's probably what, about a 19, 20, 21 micron. Would you say? Uh, it'd be 20 micron. 20 micron, and uh, it's probably enough length there. We thought that maybe able to shear twice a year if you were inclined to. At the nearby Elmore Field Day site, five different wool and meat breeds will run together for six years under the same conditions in a test of profitability. The Merinos did well. When we look at the economics of the situation, okay, you can run more merinos, say the local merinos, okay, they're a smaller frame sheep, they've got um, a lower lambing percentage, so you can run a few more of them. But one of the things is um, when we actually look at a, say, a 20 or 30 year period, what might happen? and uh, there's fancy computer programs that can actually do this and it seems as though the merinos are much more resilient in droughts than the first cross use. Merino wool prices are up 40 to 60 cents per kilogram, one of the highest levels in four years. Even the cheaper crossbred wools are continuing to attract record prices. <laughs> At the Melbourne auction rooms recently, wool brokers Roberts sold some Flinders Island crossbred wool at the coarsest end of the Micron range for a top price. To be getting six fifty, nearly seven dollars greasy for that type of wool is, is fantastic. And I guess their primary role on the property is to be producing fat lambs, so um, wool's a bit of a, a byproduct. But to be receiving uh, those sort of prices, it certainly makes it uh, a whole lot more worthwhile. Analyst Peter Morgan says the price rises across the Micron range are driven by demand. It's China, China, China. They've been driving it uh, all the way since the end of January. It's across all microns, absolutely everything, whether it's fleece wool or, or the, the not so good, the skirtings and pieces, the, the cardings, uh, they've all, all been going uh, uh, literally gangbusters since Easter.
25 years ago, the wool industry was dominated by Japanese and European processing and buying companies. Now China processes 90% of the world's wool. With the European winter looming, Chinese processors are preparing and the market is reflecting that. The demand in the knitted products for women's wear in particular has been very strong for some time now and uh, is increasingly strong. Uh, the worsted wear, the men's suiting, women's jackets and that wasn't quite so strong but everything's strong now and uh, there's, there's probably uh, a rush on to get uh, product garments and fabrics and that ready for the northern winter. Tasmanians Chris and Richard Headlam are keeping a close eye on the wool markets, but they're also making the most of good meat prices. Today they're working with their livestock agent, weighing and preparing a load of Dooney weathers for market. The South African dual purpose sheep has high fertility and rapid growth rates. What would push you over to meat, completely meat? Um. Good question. I think um, it's it'll just come down to a dollar figure, I suppose. We we um, we've sort of kept both income streams going because wool and, and meat seems to have been a, a most logical direction to go. Um, so to go all meat, I suppose, um, yeah, it's probably it's certainly on the cards, but it's just a matter of, of seeing what you know what stacks up with with where we're at with our own. Um, flock at the moment. The move towards more dual purpose or meat sheep is really catching on in this traditional fine wool producing country in Tasmania's northern Midlands and it's new irrigation right up and down this dry region that's fuelling the change. The shift to prime lamb production across the country has prompted fears about the shrinking national merino flock. It's a real concern to us. Um, we look after a thousand studs nationally um, and their ram sales have been dropping quite dramatically over the last few years and, and also too it then flows on to commercial merino breeders so we're really concerned about it. The new president of the Australian Association of Stud Merino Breeders, Georgie Wallace, has watched the number of merino ewes decline by about two million a year. A lot of people have diversified into prime lamb operations. They've uh, probably gone into cropping more. Um, you know, when I look back, you know, in 1991, the floor price scheme crashed. And since then, the wool market, we've had a few reasonable years in amongst that, and that's 24 years ago. Um, and we've lost, a, you know, probably a whole generation of, of growers to, to growing wool. Um, it's pleasing now to see that the market has improved. Um, it's getting up to more sustainable levels. So, you know, hopefully um, that's what we're going to try and highlight, is that um, merino operations can be profitable. Even a passionate merino producer like Georgie Wallace has gone into meat production. Her farm has diversified into crossbreeds. We decided that, um, that probably uh, the composites uh, were a little bit more profitable for us at the time. Um, that's why we've kept the stud, it's you know, the core nucleus there, so that um, when the wool market did return, that we could, um, we could, you know, we can still always up the ante with our merinos again. As more merino ewes are being joined to non-merino rams, crossbreeds are changing the makeup of the Australian flock. Probably the biggest um, uh, drive at the moment has been to push for more lambs. Uh, probably not quite as much uh, on being the heaviest wool cutter, and I think that probably shows in Australia's um, wool cut average uh, for ewes and flocks. It's actually declining a bit at the moment. Three weeks to hay. So... The changes are reflected in dwindling merino ram sales, but agricultural consultant Dr Job Webb Ware isn't worried. 
is the merino flock going to be big enough to replace itself effectively because so many have been joined to terminals? And look, I, I think I'm not as pessimistic as quite a few people on that because I think market forces will actually help out a lot if, if there's, um, and, and certainly with the recent increase in uh, the wolf um, prices, um, uh, people will start to have a closer look at uh, that shift towards uh, the meat breeds. Sheep classer and stud specialist Chris Bowman has watched the merino become a highly competitive dual purpose sheep. A lot of the studs now are testing for high muscle area and um, you know just selecting a sheep that's, um, that's got, a, got more carcass attributes um, and also I mean the wool quality um, is very very good on the Australian wool clip. Um, all our wools now are um, you know up around that 99% comfort factor. Ross McGecky is one of those stud merino breeders. He's breeding a bigger framed dual purpose merino popular in the current market. In fact, his Terrick West stud on the plains of northern Victoria is capturing two markets. With the fine medium wool sheep with a bit of bulk that we're trying to breed, people with a, that have been breeding a stronger are looking to, for something to find their clip down but not to lose the size and cut they've, got, they've had. And coming from the other way, I think some people who are looking to get a bit more size and bulk into the finer wool sheep, but they don't want to, they don't want to ruin the, the quality of wool they've had. And we'd like to think that we're able to provide rams in that category too that can go into those finer, super fine sheep and not damage the quality of their wool. So th this is a a typical super fine sort of ewe, you can see, very well covered sort of ewe. Uh, due to be shorn in about another six weeks. Even producers of super fine wool are looking at other options. Alan Phillips and his family are passionate super fine wool producers at Deddington in northeast Tasmania. But they've had to consider meat sheep, cattle and even tourism. We looked at other opportunities and we decided with the uh, type of country we have here that um, realistically whatever else we tried to do we wouldn't be able to do it uh, very successfully. Although prices for wool across the board are up, superfine wool no longer attracts the premium it did 10 years ago. That's because of an oversupply. And although he's had to consider meat production, Alan Phillips hasn't lost faith in the merino. It might sound a bit pig-headed, but um, I kind of like what I'm doing and, and I, I think that that's what the country is suited for and um, yeah, I'm still fairly confident that uh, it will come around and we certainly don't want to... Uh, we've taken a long time to get the genetics to where they are and um, yeah, I don't really want to lose them at this stage. Analyst Peter Morgan believes the premium price for the top-end superfine wool is unlikely to be achieved again anytime soon. At a recent industry forum, China's biggest processors were showing interest in the finer wools, but he says they're not willing to pay top dollar. 80 per cent of the wool of 19 microns and finer is going directly to China these days and they just don't pay the prices that uh, the Italians were prepared to pay. The market is forcing many merino farmers to think about change, but there's confidence that merinos will continue to be the nation's predominant sheep breed. There's quite a number of wool uh, flocks which are very profitable and have been consistently profitable. So it's a, it's a matter of for, for, for um, wool growers and prime lamb producers, beef enterprises, is to look at what you do and th th this enormous variation which exists in enterprise performance and look at what, what the underlying uh, factors which drive profitability and, and examine that and, uh, and, and there is an enormous opportunity for producers to increase profitability within looking at the flock, uh, their own flock rather than chasing a rainbow.
if we see you in, in five years' time, do you think things will, your operation will be different or...? Yeah, it's, I'm hoping to be a fraction bigger, but I still think I'll be in Merinos. I still think I'll be um, uh, with the dual purpose. This, this Centre Plus bloodline I've been very happy with. I think a lot of studs have caught up to them now. There's a lot of good genetics out there, good sheep out there. Um, um, but, uh, yeah, I think I'll still be pushing on, and, and um, I don't know if I'll be getting quantum leaps, but, um, yeah, I'll still be making a profit out of them, I hope. Otherwise, if I'm not, I won't be farming.